Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be looking at question number 3 on 2011 Form B, the AP Chemistry exam. We're going to continue looking at these FR keys as we go through this entire pre-response class so that you understand how to approach these questions on the AP Chemistry exam. If you like these videos or find them informative, please be sure to like and subscribe. And with that, let's get started on our question. Here it is. So question number 3, answer the following questions about glucose. C6H12O6, an important biochemical energy source. Alright, so part A says, write the empirical formula of glucose. Alright, so the empirical formula of glucose is what? Well, what is an empirical formula? So an empirical formula is essentially the, the formula of a molecule that has the least whole number coefficients of each of the molecules. So here we have C6H12O6. Well, each of these coefficients right here, are, su are subscripts, can be are a multiple of 6. So we could divide each of these by 6, and we still have the same ratio of the molecules. That's really what the empirical formula means. It's just trying to keep the ratio of the molecules. So we can divide each of these by 6, and we get that our empirical formula ends up being... C H two oh that is our empirical formula. Let's move on to the next part. Alright, next part. Here it is. Uh, in many organisms glucose is oxidized to carbon dioxide and water as represented by the following equation, which is cellular respiration. A 2.50 gram sample of glucose and an excess of oxygen gas were placed in a calorimeter. After the reaction was initiated and proceeded to completion, total heat released by the energy was calculated to be 39 kilojoules. And we're trying to calculate the value of the change in enthalpy in kilojoules per mole. Okay, let's see. How are we going to go about doing this question? Well, we're given, we're given a mass of glucose. 2.5 grams. And now what? Well, we can convert that to moles. Right? So we can convert that to moles, bust out our calculator, and we see we have 6 times 12.01 for carbon, we have 12 times 1.008 of hydrogen, and we have 6 times the 16 grams per mole of oxygen. We add that up, and we get that. The molar mass of glucose is 180.156 grams per one mole. That's the molar mass. And that is going to equal... It's going to equal 2.5 divided by the 180.156 is going to equal 0. 0, 1, 4 moles. Alright, well now what? Well, we have the number of moles, and we have the amount of kilojoules that was, uh, that, that was released due to that, due to that number of moles. So we have our 39 kilojoules divided by our 0. 0.14 moles. Right now, is this going to be positive or negative? Well, we're releasing heat. So the amount of heat in the system is going down, so the enthalpy is going down. So this is going to be negative. And we're going to make that, set that equal. We're going to do negative 39 divided by our 0 0.014. And we get that the enthalpy here is negative 2810 kilojoules kilojoules per mole and that is our answer let's move on to the next part all right part c says when oxygen is not available, glucose can be oxidized by fermentation. In this process, ethanol and carbon dioxide are produced as represented by the following equation. 
The value of the equilibrium constant Kp for the reaction at 298 Kelvin is 8.9 times 10 to the, can't read it from that word, times 10 to the 39th. Ooh, that's a large Kp. I want to ask to calculate the value of the standard free energy change if delta G for the reaction at 298K Kelvin. Well, we have a temperature, we know the gas constant, so it's constant, and we have a Kp. So now we can write, we can use our equation that we know, which is delta G, delta G standard equals negative R T L and K. All right, so that's going to be negative, uh, let's see. So the gas constant that we're going to use here, it's going to be, well, we're, we're trying to figure this out in terms of delta G. So it's an energy change, so it's in joules. So we're going to use our gas constant for joules, which is 8.314 times 298 Kelvin times the natural log of 8.9 times 10 to the 39th. And then one thing that's important to note here is that this is in joules, not kilojoules. Right, we're we want to find it in kilojoules. All right, so in kilojoules, we're just going to divide this by 1,000. We're going to well, first we can like actually figure out what this is. What this is equal to, it is 6.314 minus 298 times natural log of 8.9 times 10 to the 39th. And that is negative 227. 904 joules per mole. So that means that if we're going to divide that by a thousand, and we get that our answer is then negative 227.9, or really, because of significant failure, just 228 kilojoules per mole. And we can move on to the next part. Let's go. So, this was part one of part C. All right, let's move on to part two. We're asked to calculate the value of the standard entropy change delta S in joules uh, per Kelvin per mole for the reaction at 298 Kelvin. All right, so we can bust out another one of our equations. Uh, Right, we know that we have the equation that delta G standard equals delta H standard minus T delta S standard. All right, so delta G standard is negative 228, 228, and it's going to equal the enthalpy, which is for this reaction, negative 68, and subtracting, we're going to be subtracting what? We're going to be subtracting 298 times the entropy, but that entropy is going to be, actually, I'll write that this way, times the change entropy standard, but that entropy is going to be in joules, we're gonna have to divide that by a thousand to get that in to get this to be this part to be in kilojoules. And then we can solve for S delta S standard and we get that it is and we get that the change in entropy for this reaction here is going to be the three significant figures 537 joules 
per Kelvin per mole. That is our standard entropy. And we can move on to the next part. All right, part three of part C. Does it indicate whether the equilibrium constant for the fermentation reaction increases, or decreases, or remains the same if the temperature is increased? Justify your answer. All right, so I'm gonna pull out a text box right here. This is going to be an explanation question. We can think about, we can think logically about how we're gonna go about doing this. All right, so let's see. Um, so since the entropy or the standard change in entropy is a positive if i increase the temperature then the negative c let's put that in this place the negative t delta all right i wanted a capital delta Negative T delta S is going to get more negative, right? So, since we have that delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, then this will make the this is going to make the delta g more negative all right then then what how, well how does that factor in well since we have have that we can pull out another one of our equations which is that the Delta G equals negative, negative RT ln K. Then a decrease in, or a, yeah, decrease in the free energy would be a decrease for the negative RT ln K, the decrease in the free energy then would be an increase in the positive RT ln K. It would be an, an increase in the RT ln K. All right. So basically what we did is we just took uh, what the temperature was, huh? And then we just tried to manipulate what that meant in terms of in terms of what else we were doing here, right? So essentially, we are just trying to we are just trying to figure out how the equilibrium constant changes based on the temperature. So we connect the equilibrium constant to something else, which is the Gibbs free energy. And then we connect Gibbs free energy back to the enthalpy and the entropy because you know, that entropy is it's going the uh, the Gibbs free energy is going to change based on the temperature since temperature times entropy is a factor. However, there is a problem that we run into here, which is that when we have an increase in the R T L N K, but we don't know how much of that increase is caused by the temperature increasing or the L N K increasing. All right, so there is a difference here. There is a disparity here. So this whole thing is going to be wrong. So even if you've written this, don't be afraid to just turn back and try again, because this these things will happen, and you have to kind of realize what what these questions, uh, what these the the style of these questions are, and what kind of justifications you use for what. And so first we tried the clearest route we had, which is just using the uh, Gibbs free energy and then changing that to the equilibrium constant. Right? It, it seemed to make sense. But there is more that we learn during our thermodynamics, our study of thermodynamics, which is how the equilibrium constant changes based on the enthalpy of a reaction. All right, so let's think about it from that perspective, from the enthalpy perspective. So what do we have? Well, we have that 
the enthalpy of this reaction is negative, so it is an endothermic reaction. Endothermic reaction. Then the reverse reaction must be, or no, the since it's negative, this is an this is an exothermic reaction. A negative is exothermic. The reverse reaction, the positive direction, is going to be endothermic. Endothermic direction. What do we know about the endothermic direction? Well, we know that the endothermic direction is the one that is most affected by temperature changes. Right? So if it if the temperature decreases, then the reverse reaction rate is going to decrease more than the or the endothermic reaction rate is going to decrease more than the exothermic reaction rate. Here we're told that the temperature is increased, so the uh, endothermic direction is going to increase more, the reverse reaction is going to increase more, and more of the glucose, the solid glucose, is going to be created because the reverse reaction is going to be faster. Right, so now we have to just verbalize that. So since the temperature is is increased, the reaction rate of the endothermic direction increases more than that of the exothermic thermic direction. So what does that mean? So more reactants will be created and more products will be used up. So the equilibrium constant, if you have more reactants and less products, the equilibrium constant will decrease. And as so the equilibrium constant decreases. And we can move on to part D. All right, part D. And here it is, using your answer for part B, where we calculated the, uh, the delta H for the combustion of glucose. Uh, and the information provided in part C, calculate the value of delta H for the following reaction. Alright, how are we going to go about doing this here? Let's think about this. Alright, so what can we do here? Well, what we could do is that we have that reaction for part C, the um, the glucose becomes 2 ethanol plus 2 carbon dioxide, and we're going to flip that because we want the ethanol on the reactant side. So we're going to flip that and get 2C2H5OH plus 2CO2 is going to become C6H12O6. And then we're going to take the other reaction, I'm just going to put that in there. So the one that we have in right after part A, we have C6H12O6 plus 6 oxygen gas, and that becomes 6 carbon dioxide. Oops, 6 carbon dioxide plus 6 H2O. Alright, and now we're going to add these up. So the first thing we see is that this is going to cancel out with this. Right? That's the first thing that happens. And now we're left with 2 ethanol plus 2 carbon dioxide um, plus 6 oxygen to become 6 carbon dioxide plus 6 uh, water. So then these two are going to cancel out, these two carbon dioxides are going to cancel out here. I'm going to be left with four carbon dioxides, and we can rewrite this equation in the next slide where we have uh, two ethanols. Two ethanols plus six oxygens go to four carbon dioxide plus. 6H2O, and then we're going to divide this whole thing by 2, and we get that an ethanol plus 3 oxygen gas becomes 2 carbon dioxide and 3 waters, which is exactly what they gave us in the question. All right, so now we figured out how to combine these equations to get there, and now we just got to think about how we're actually going to do this. Alright, 
So how are we going to do it? Well, the first thing we did, the first thing we did here is that we flipped the equation after part C. And we flipped that equation after part C, right? So we can make that 68 kilojoules per mole now. And then we had the, we had the delta H of the combustion reaction, the negative 2810. And we're going to add those two up. And that's how we got this equation right here that's on the screen right now. The two ethanols plus six oxygens goes to four carbon dioxide plus six waters. And then we're going to divide that by two, divide that by two to get just the ethanol plus three oxygen becomes two carbon dioxide plus three waters. Right, so on the AP exam, you have more space to write this out and you could write out each of the delta H's. But here we're just going to go about doing, uh, we're going here, the main idea is just trying to figure out how to manipulate the equations you already have to get the equation you want and then just messing with the delta H on the way there. And we get that our final delta H of the entire thing is going to be the three sig figs, negative 1,300, negative 1,370 kilojoules per mole. Kilojoules per mole. And that is it for this question. All right, I hope you enjoyed this video or found it informative. And be sure to tune in next time when we continue looking at more of these AP Chemistry FRQs. I'll see you later.